for those of you who may not know me, I'm Christoph, I'm one of the PPY4 EM IMs, and as part of the social EM lecture series, I'm going to talk a little bit about sex and gender in medicine. So objectives for this talk are to, to have you all understand the interplay of the concepts of sex and gender, um, to understand the importance of considering sex and gender in patient care and in clinical research, and to understand key criticisms of uh, examining sex and gender-based medicine. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the concepts of sex and gender. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the historical basis for sex and gender in medicine. Go through a few clinical applications, a couple of criticisms of sex and gender-based medicine, and then give you a couple of resources that you can go to to find out a little bit more. So in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir wrote that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So for those of you who are not familiar with Simone de Beauvoir, she wasn't a biologist. She was not a clinician. She was an existential philosopher and one of the pioneers of the second wave of feminism. And so when she made this, when she wrote this, she wasn't talking about the natural course of an XX chromosome infant that grows to be an XX chromosome child presumably goes through menarche and is then presumably able to bear children. Instead, what she was making was a distinction between sex and gender. She was saying that what the, the state of womanhood, the state of being a woman, is not one that is determined by biology. It's not any more intrinsic to a person's biology than a person's taste in uh, foods or taste in trashy television. And so sex versus gender. Most of us have learned that these are two distinct, somewhat related, but very separate concepts. We have sex, which is a biological imperative. It's determined by chromosomes, it's determined by genes, determined by hormones and reproductive organs. Whereas gender, on the other hand, is a social construct that is encompasses a person's roles, a person's behaviors, their self-expression, self-identity, and their social identity. And we learned that these are very, very separate. And the truth is that they are. They're not one in the same. However, when it comes to applying sex and gender in the, in the field of medicine, it becomes a little bit more complex. Because the reality is that a person's biological sex affects their, how they're treated by others, their gender, which then affects biology. And so they, they, there's, a, there's a struggle. And sometimes the two are congruous and sometimes they're not. But when we're applying this to medicine, it, it, it becomes a little bit difficult sometimes to parse out whether sex or gender is more at play. So if we break it down and look at social, uh, social constructs and biological constructs as they relate to the life course, we can say that at our most basic level, when we think back to embryology, we know that the X chromosome and the Y chromosome determine male and female. And the Y chromosome essentially encodes male. We know, we remember the SRY gene that encodes the testes, that create testosterone, there's a testosterone surge in the third trimester of pregnancy, which masculinizes the body, masculinizes the brain, and leads to further testosterone later in life, as in during, during a puberty. So we have the biological constructs. We have hormones, genes, medical comorbidities, and those play into a person's life throughout their life course to determine their health. But on the other hand, we can think about environmental factors. Think about epigenetics. And so through uh, mechanisms like gene silencing, methylation, histone modification, X inactivation, the environment can very much impact a person's genetics and therefore their health. So we look at the economic factors, we look at behavioral factors, what risk-taking behaviors does that person have? We look at other environmental factors that can impact a person's health. And all of this is, is intertwined to affect what a person's health status is going to be. And they're so intertwined that some folks have recommended that we don't even separate the two, say sex, gender. We say, call it sex 
hyphen gender or sex slash gender to recognize the fact that yes, these are two very distinct terms, very distinct concepts, but they're inextricably linked either because like I said before, they're incongruous or they work together to promote a person's self-identity. In her same book, The Second Sex in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir wrote that the, the present enshrines the past and the past and in the past, all history has been made by men. To be fair, Simone de Beauvoir was talking about societal history. She was talking about wars and inventions and hierarchical power, uh, political power. But the same can really be said for the history of medicine in the sense that historically it was presumed that the 70 kilogram white male was the standard and that male cells are equivalent to female cells, that men's health is equivalent to women's health, except when it comes to reproductive organs. And it was a little bit easier for researchers to just study men because they didn't have to account for a fetus. They didn't have to account for hormonal fluctuations with the menstrual cycle. So it's a little bit cheaper. And so with that in mind, I wanna talk about this statue. Some of you may recognize it. This is a statue of Alison Lapper that is in Trafalgar Square in London. Now, Alison Lapper was born with Bocamelia. She was not, as far as I know, exposed to thalidomide in utero. However, this statue is, is for many people a representation of the thalidomide epidemic that occurred in the 1960s. And so what that was, just as a reminder, was uh, pregnant women were taking thalidomide for morning sickness, and it led to a, an epidemic of birth defects across Europe. And so the reason I want to bring this up is that it was this thalidomide tragedy in the 1960s that led to big changes within the United States with respect to sex and gender and medicine. Because following that, in 1975, the National Commission for, uh, for the Protection of Human Subjects determined that pregnant women were vulnerable subjects when it comes to clinical research. Soon after, in 1977, the FDA essentially banned women from being included in clinical trials. Now, there wasn't their entire uh, goal. What they, their guidance was that women of childbearing potential should not be included in phase one or early phase two trials. But the term childbearing potential was, was broadened, and women who didn't have childbearing potential were also not included. And this continued until 1993, when the FDA finally reversed that guidance and allowed women to determine for themselves, along with their, their doctors, if they wanted to be included in early trials. And that same year, in 1993, the US Congress passed the NIH Revitalization Act, which actually mandated that women be included in clinical trials. Um, unfortunately, the mandate was a little bit difficult to enforce. It was a little bit unwieldy. Um, and so, and it did, in addition, it only applied to NIH funded studies. So industry funded studies could do what they want. And in NIH trials where women were being included, the data was not always actually um, uh, studied or reported in a sex-based manner so that it wasn't always actually useful in clinical practice. But things did start to improve. And then in 2016, the NIH implemented its sex as a biological variable policy, in which they said that all research funded by the NIH, preclinical animal research, cellular research, human research, should include sex as a variable. So in the design, it should be designed in a way that sex-based data could be taken from, from the findings. And it should be reported that way so that we get more of an idea of, is there a difference? Is there similarities? So we talked a little bit about the concepts of sex and gender. We've talked about the history and research. So what does this mean for our clinical practice? How does this actually apply? Well, one of the areas in which talking about sex and gender in medicine is most important is in the realm of cardiovascular health. So we all, when we have our patients who were concerned about ACS, we know about the, the general risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity. 
But how many of us think about how these risk factors differentially affect women versus men? Because in reality, there is a difference. Hypertension and hyperlipidemia actually increase the risk of, of cardiovascular disease in men more than it increases that in women. Whereas on the other hand, diabetes, smoking, and metabolic syndrome increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in women more than that of men. In addition, women are more likely to suffer from what we call non-traditional risk factors. So that can be things like depression, things like autoimmune diseases, which does increase a person's risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And then finally, women also have pregnancy-related factors. So hypertension in pregnancy, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes. These are things, all things to consider when speaking with a woman who may be suffering from a cardiovascular illness. In addition to risk factors, we talk about presentations of ACS. We talk about typical and atypical ACS. And typical is, is defined essentially as the exertional chest pain. And this is typical because historically, ACS was, was very much a man disease. It was, it was men who get it. And while chest pain is the most common presentation for ACS in all comers, all genders, all sexes, women, and particularly younger women, are more likely to also have atypical presentation, as in epigastric discomfort, as in shortness of breath, as in just fatigue, just feeling fatigued for no reason, and nausea and vomiting. And then beyond the risk factors, beyond the presentations, there actually is often a difference in the etiology of the coronary disease between the sexes. So whereas men are very likely to have macrovascular disease that can be stented with a cardiac cath, women are likely to have microvascular disease, which we don't often think about and which really is, is still being studied to really elucidate. And so just like macrovascular disease, microvascular disease is a, an imbalance between supply and demand. And it can be caused by functional problems, such as difficulty dilating vessels to in increase blood flow, which is most likely caused by endothelial dysfunction, often due to diabetes or smoke. Or it can be caused by constriction, vasospasm. It can be microvascular disease also happens due to structural issues, remodeling of the vascular walls, which is often due to uh, hypertrophy. And then finally, you can have myocardial or extravascular causes for microvascular dysfunction. And that would be LVH. That would be decreased diastolic time. And that would be things like coronary cardiac edema that compresses the microvasculature. But my goal in telling you this is that we need to think about the varying uh, etiologies and how sex and gender may play into that when we're seeing our patients in the emergency department. Because what's also interesting is that women tend to have, or people who have microvascular disease tend to have poorer outcomes than those who have macrovascular disease. And female identified patients, regardless of their biological sex at birth, also tend to have poorer outcomes after MI. Aside from cardiovascular disease, there's also an interplay of sex and gender when it comes to drugs, medicines, pharmaceuticals. And it's commonly been stated that women tend to have more adverse effects from pharmaceuticals than do men. Uh, it's postulated that perhaps it's because women have more contact with the healthcare system, are diagnosed with more chronic diseases, and potentially have more polypharmacy. But one of the, but there are other reasons as well, and some of it has to do with just the makeup of, of women and men's bodies. And so one that comes to mind is a drug that we use pretty often, propofol. Now propofol is a lipophilic compound, and although initially, if you can see on the, in the chart on the left of the screen, although given an initial bolus of propofol, a woman will initially have a higher concentration of propofol in the blood. Very quickly, a woman's concentration will 
fall below that of amends. And that means they may wake up faster and may actually need a little bit higher dosing than a man of the same weight. And this is in, in opposition to, to rocuronium, which we use for paralysis, which is a hydrophilic compound. And on the other side, rocuronium, women actually tend to have a faster onset. They make, it's longer acting. And they have a higher concentration of rocuronium in the blood. So when we're thinking about our RSI drugs or thinking about uh, post-intubation sedation, we may want to think about potentially dosing propofol for women on the higher end of the weight-based spectrum and rocuronium on the lower side of the weight-based spectrum. Another drug that was in the news a lot, uh, maybe a little over a decade ago, is that of zolpidem. Zolpidem is in sleep aids like Ambien, Lunesta, and it was out for several years before in 2013 the FDA changed the dosing, saying that women, the initial dosing for women should be lower than that of men. And the reason they did this was because there were so many cases of folks who would take a sleep aid at night, wake up the next morning, and then get into a car accident. And when they looked at the data, what they found was that it tended to be women, and it tended to be that women, the concentration of, of zolpidem in women's blood was higher after eight hours than in that of men. And so that was why the, the dosing recommending, re recommendation was changed. That said, as of last year, in 2019, there was actually a, a study by um, a researcher out of Tufts who looked re-looked at the data and, and questioned, you know, is this actually true? So the dosing actually be the same? And, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer for that right now, but my point is that had the initial data been examined on a, on a sex and gender basis, perhaps this is not a question that we would be having two decades later. So I've talked about sex and gender in medicine. And you can probably tell that I think that it's important that we examine it from the basis of clinical research, that we think about it when we see our patients. But there are those that, that don't believe that. And one of the reasons, one of the criticisms of sex and gender-based medicine is that we don't have great definitions. So like I said at the beginning of this talk, sex and gender are two separate but very, very related terms. And when we're talking about them in, this, in the setting of medicine, they become a muddle. And it's very, very hard to parse out one from the other. And so in this, in this article by um, Hammerstrom, they looked at a lot of papers, journals that discussed sex and gender in medicine and recognized that people were using the terms in different ways. There wasn't a clear definition. And I, and I agree that we do need to come up with better definitions. And we need to be able to define our terms if we're going to study it. But I don't think that's a reason to completely not, not do the research. Another criticism is that the 2016 mandate by the NIH requiring preclinical studies to examine sex, you know, male cells, female cells, male animals, female animals, is that we may be finding differences that don't actually apply to clinic clinical medicine. So we may end up going down a rabbit hole thinking that something that we find in rats is applicable to humans. And I agree that that may be the case, but I think we do that with, with all animal studies. I don't think that sex and gender is any different than when we're finding, finding other differences that exist in animals. And then we look at humans to see if it actually translates. And Within this, some authors have questioned, if we're looking at sex and gender, are we essentializing people? Are we gonna get to the point where somebody comes into the emergency department and we say, you're a woman, you must have mic microvascular disease, you're not gonna get a cat. And you know, I, I agree that we should not be essentializing people, but I think that as clinicians, I think we, we have the ability to see in gray 
we don't see everyone in black and white. And I think we have the ability to, to integrate information and make these decisions in a reasonable fashion. So I just want to give you a couple of places where you can look to find out a little bit more about the field of sex and gender-based medicine. The first one is the Sex and Gender Specific Health Project, which is out of Texas Tech, the Laura W. Bush Institute. And if you, you can just Google it. Um, there's a bunch of slides, there's videos, there's a link to plenty of resources because this really is a burgeoning field. Additionally, there's the Gender Innovations Project, which is out of Stanford. And in the Gender Innovations Project, there's information about sex and gender analysis, particularly as it pertains to research and research design. And then finally, the NIH is, is also behind this effort. And the NIH, their website is coming along. They're creating e-learning courses for researchers and for clinicians to learn how this applies to either their research subjects or their patients. So I hope that you understand now that one, sex and gender are extremely related, very separate, but in the field of medicine, when we're dealing with individual patients, they can be difficult to parse out one from the other. I want you to think about the fact that sex and gender interact across a lifespan, from conception to death, to affect a person's health, affect a person's risk factors, affect a person's interaction with the healthcare system. And finally, I want you to consider that sex and gender have a, have a myriad of potential effects that we should consider when seeing our patients clinically. So when you see that woman who just says they're just fatigued and they have no reason, is there a possibility that there's ACS going on? I'm not saying order a troponin all of them. Just something to think about when you're seeing those patients. Audrey Lord wrote that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I think that when we talk about clinical medicine, we have to keep this in mind. Because every day, especially in our hospitals, we see inequalities. We see economic inequalities, racial inequalities, ethnic inequalities, sex and gender-based inequalities. And I think that if we keep doing the same thing, doing the same types of research, applying the same clinical medicine, we're gonna to continue to see those. So I think we have to completely remake the system. And I think that studying sex and gender-based medicine is a way to do that, to apply a completely different concept and perhaps start to break away at some of those inequalities. Excuse my references. 